Greetings and welcome to R. Kelly Appeal TV, where we discuss the appeal process of Robert Sylvester Kelly. In today's episode, we're going to be showing some information that I think will tie into Robert Sylvester Kelly, you know, where he's at, um, what he's dealing with inside of incarceration in America, and um, it's going to be a very interesting topic. For those interested in the Cash App upload for May 29th, 2022, check the description box below for details. So tonight, I would like to share some historical facts of what the prison system in America actually looks like to celebrities. Um, I'm not going to go with what I believe or what someone inside is telling me. I'm going to go back historically, and we're going to look at it from that perspective. I'm going to share stories about how two very influential people that we may remember has been convicted of crimes as a celebrity. The first one is titled The Father of Rock and Roll from St. Louis when he took a white 14-year-old over state lines to hire her to work as a wait waitress in his downtown restaurant. He then fired her weeks later, and when she got arrested for prostitution, she was known for prostitution, charges were pressed against the singer, landing him in jail for the second time with a 20-month sentence. He was convicted of the Man Act, and it's the earliest uh, um, conviction of the Man Act that we can go back in history on, and it's 1961. So let's listen to this interview and see if there are some parallels that we can make regarding the R. Kelly case in being the king of R&B. Chuck Berry on the origins of rock and roll. The society was rebelling against this new thing that was coming in and taking the kids' attention and their mind from the schoolwork and things. But it was uh, like... Uh, punk wave and all the other fads that come in. They come and they go. Only rock and roll stayed. Rock and roll wasn't brand new. It was just named, coined a little different because it was boogie woogie and, and I've heard rock and roll before, what we call rock and roll before the term rock and roll of it ever came just to surface. Really, so it isn't brand new. It's just changed and along with the times and the way you handle it. And the way it's played, along with technology, you know, in the recording. Hi-Fi came in right along about the time rock and roll came in, so it made it that much better. The times were there for it. It's not that I did so much for rock and roll. Time did a lot for rock and roll. Uh, I'm a cog in the, I consider myself a cog in the wheel, like Jerry and, and Domino and Richard and Bo and Clyde McFadden and all the rest. But I tell you what, that I think sets me out distinct is because I strictly recorded my music to I, to be an identity to the teenager and their uh, uh, stand in uh, life and and uh, and uh, living and I think that's what uh, and it wasn't too much love it was some of the uh, uh, curricula that they were going through especially school so I think that's what most of my music is. Uh, uh, indistinctive. You know, we call it rock, we call it, you know, boogie joogie, we call it rhythm and blues, call it what you may. Man, I play what I feel, and I love what I feel. If they call it rock, it's rock. They call it, uh, uh, what is it, country bumpkin jazz, they call it country bumpkin jazz. But I like what I play. Je joue la musique que j'aime. I love the music I play. So in that interview, he is talking about who he is. So if you remember Chuck Berry back in the day, um, that's who we're talking about today. He was the one that was convicted of taking a 14-year-old over state lines in order to hire her. Barry's soaring music career was derailed again in 1961 when he was convicted under, under the Man Act of illegally transporting a woman across state lines for immoral purposes. Three years earlier in 1958, Barry had opened Club Bandstand 
in the predominantly white business district of downtown St. Louis. The next year, while traveling in Mexico, he had met a 14-year-old waitress and sometimes prostitute and brought her back to St. Louis to work at his club. However, he fired her only weeks later, and when she was then arrested for prostitution charges, were pressed against Barry that ended with him spending yet another 20 months in jail. Now, when Barry was released from prison, so the, the very first thing that he had done was, um, I think it was a robbery or something like that when he was young, when he was young. So when Barry was released from prison in 1963, he picked up right where he left off writing and recording popular and innovative songs. His 1960 hit included, but I figure it was mostly jail. Barry released one of his latest albums um, later. So he was known as the rock and roll father. Um, Barry died March 18th, 2017 at the age of 90. He is remembered as a founding father of rock and roll, whose pioneering career influenced generations of musicians. So um, the Man Act, this was the very first Man Act done to a celebrity in African-American um, culture um, relating to music and Hollywood industry. So what are your thoughts about that? Now we're going to move on to the second interview. Um, this comes from the number one heavyweight boxing champion of the world. And during this time when he was actually coming up, it was amazing because Aaliyah would, um, opened up for one of his boxing matches. Um, that's what Barry Hankerson was talking about when he said that she came in and that's how she became Aaliyah, you know, really truthfully after all the mentorship that had been done with R. Kelly and one in a million and all that. So, well, when she hit one in a million, that's when she had opened up for Mike Tyson. And so we're going to talk about him because he was accused of rape and he was convicted by an all white male jury. So he's going to talk about his experience in prison firsthand. And he's going to help us ease the, our minds of what is really going on with Robert Sylvester Kelly inside right now um, in the institution of incarceration with R. Kelly. And, and I just want to say disproportionate minority confinement is a very strong impact in our culture. And when they are knocking down our celebrities, it's making it very vital for us because what legacy are we going to have in the music industry that will make someone want to show their talents to the world, create that peace and harmony that music brings about. So let's get a little bit um, into the interview. Our men, our African-American men in America, they, you, you guys go through so much. And in this Mike Tyson interview, before we get to the Larry King one, I want to show you how the taunting and the, the narrative of disrespect to where Mike Tyson had to break the, these dudes down. He had to tell them, listen, it's not that type of party, dude. You know, you can't come at me like that. I've done what I did. I've served my time. And now you're going to respect this. You, you're going to put some respect on my name. So let's listen to this video. This is with, uh, I want to say, CNN as well. Welcome back to Highly Questionable, brought to you by Evan Williams. Joining us in the kitchen today is Mike Tyson. The former world heavyweight champion, always interesting. He's got a new book out, Undisputed Truth. It's out right now. It talks about his path in life. Let's ask him about it. Mike, you've led a hugely interesting life. Why did you decide to write about it in the book? Well, um, they, they wanted me to write a book for a long period of time. And eventually, someone was going to write the book anyway, so I decided I might as well say it in my own words. Was there any story in there that was hard for you to tell? Yes, when I was a young kid and about my daughter that passed away. Other than that, everything was smooth breathing, I think. 
So when you told the story, for example, about being in Miami and kicking Don King in the head and having a brick of cocaine, that seems crazy to me. Well, that's what it was. Can you describe, uh, Mike, what your cocaine addiction was like? No, you can read about it in the book, though. Is there anything that was embarrassing to you, or is it well, something pretty, yeah, pretty break? much Well, pretty much a great deal of the book was, but um, that was the book. Uh, he wanted the truth. I gave him the truth. What would you describe as the happiest time in your life, Mike? Um, I don't remember. Do you feel like... Looking back on your boxing career and how it affected your life, you were the heavyweight champion of the world at the age of 20 years old. Did you feel like, looking back on it, that made your life better or not? Well, you know, um, it has ups and down points on the situation. Um, I was a young kid, and I was just out of my league as far as um, the people coming at me, the attention. Um, it was far more than what I anticipated. Are you happy that you wrote the book, Mike? Yeah, I'm very happy I wrote the book. Because we see you in a very vulnerable light. You're unusual that way. You're unusual in your ability to let people see everything. Well, um, I live my life in the public. Everyone pretty much knows my life. I'm not really transparent, you know. Um, people knew my life before I became fighting, so they would be able to say, well, Mike didn't do that, or Mike did do that. So, you know, there's always someone to come out of the, the woodworks to say he didn't do that. So I, I realized that I should put everything on the table. You reveal in the book that you had 20 girlfriends at one time, 20 at one time? Well, I, I, I didn't count them, in, but it was, it was around that many, yeah. I had a bunch of girlfriends. It's not necessarily, I didn't say, well, this is my 19th and this is my 12th. Um, it was a lot of girls. I just figuratively used that for um, words. Did anyone, an inmate, did an inmate ever try Mike Tyson in prison? No. Um, fortunately, that never happened. What would you describe your first night in prison like? Hey, um, it wasn't as worse as I thought it would be. Oh, what did you imagine it would be? Um, just not what I thought it would be. You got super educated in prison, did you not? I mean, you... Well, you... I don't know, listen, I don't know about educated. I didn't get educated in prison. I just, um, I, I was in prison and I read a few books. I'm not gonna, I didn't win a Nobel Peace Prize or anything, you know. Would you say you're more comfortable in your own skin now than you were uh, when you were heavyweight champion? Of course I am. I don't have the pressure that I did when I was heavyweight champ, but I have my days like everyone else. You feel relief, though? Do you, refil you feel relief later in life to be unburdened from that? Pretty much so, yes. Do you ever worry that you're being used for how open you can be about the things you've done in your life? I don't know. You don't want to give, and I'm, I'm doing the interview. You tell me. Hmm. That's what I'm asking, because that's kind of a dilemma sometimes when dealing with somebody is how much is asking and how much is using. I don't know. Everyone knows me. Like I said before, I'm pretty transparent and stuff, so I figure everyone see who I am anyway. I don't look at the world as if I'm a block wall and no one can see through me. But it feels like this particular process, this feels a little bit uncomfortable and that we're poking at you for book sales and that we're poking and poking, asking you questions. I, I, don't, think, I, don't, I don't think you're poking at me. Do you feel that you're poking at me? No, yeah, well, a little bit. I feel like this, this whole process is not something, you've done it for so long that it's something that's less than enjoyable to you. The idea that we would sit here and in order to sell the book, we continue to ask you questions that you may or may not want to answer. This reminds me of the part of the movie Django with Jamie Foxx. When they introduced us, when we were watching it, to the Mandingo fighter, and how the Mandingo fight was not a true sport, but a real entertainment propaganda. And it was very brutal to the point of death. So here he's fighting with these interviewers just to get his book out. Because this is what we deal with in our culture in America. How we're always sland slandered. and. You know, I just feel that this interviewer was totally, he was telling on himself that he was really poking at him, really trying to get him started. What is your view on that? I don't know. I'm asking you everything you tell me. Everything you say, I'm answering them. I'm not avoiding any of your questions. 
Do you figure that I'm avoiding anything, sir? No, no, not at all. I, I, but, I, but I'm not sure that you're enjoying it either. I'm, I've been working all day for three or four days. I'm really tired, and if I'm, if I'm offending you, I'm sorry. I'm just no. really exhausted. I'm sorry. Forgive me. Uh, did you enjoy being on stage for the one-man show? Yeah, that's what I live to do, to entertain people. Mike, you happy now? You happy? Happier? Well, I'm, I'm cool. You know, I'm not no perpetual happy guy. I'm not happy um, 24 hours a day, every second of the moment. I'm happy. Hee <laughs> hee ha ha. But um, I'm cool. I'm, you know. You look like you're always happy on the Jimmy Kimmel show. You always look happy there. Really? I, I'm, I'm having a good time on there. Mike, thank you for being on with us. We appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Now I'm going to take you to an interview with CNN. Okay, now we're going to listen to part two of the interview with Larry King. And we're going to get a little bit deeper into some true psychological aspects of being incarcerated and what that does psychologically to the mind. But let's get finished with this interview. I said, do you, how do you adjust? You never adjust to this, you never adjust. That's, um, that's what it's designed to do, I believe. As I see this, prison is designed to have you adjust. Have you adjust to being an animal, because it may not seem because you're adjusted, but it's, you know, this is a form of, um, if you could say a circus, an animal taming like environment. And we say we have to adjust in order to survive, but in, in, any, in any kind of environment that you're in, even though if you're outside, anybody that actually obeys authority is not actually free. So is it designed then to keep you in place? More so, Okay. Yes. Do you think it's supposed to produce a citizen who comes out better than when he went in? Will it do that? I, not my opinion. My opinion only that I base, it, it doesn't rehabilitate you more, so debilitate you. Because I find myself doing things that I never dreamed I'd be capable of doing. Like? Or saying things that I never think I'd be capable of saying. Like? Well, you know, I mean, just basically responding to somebody in a way that's not as pleasant as it would normally be, say, outside, if you're in a more cultivated environment. Or is you treated less than a human? Yeah, we have those days. Yeah, we have those not-to-be-human treated days. <laughs> and is that at the whim of people? You know, I mean, if you want to evaluate, since you've never been in this predicament, never. just say you have somebody just hold, and not, not to say humiliate you, just say somebody to grab you and just put you on the ground and hold you there. And just, you can't get up when you want to get up. And that could happen at any time. Basically, yeah. So that's, well, it's uh, a 24-hour cycle. Yeah, but you have to understand that. Do you do any writing? Sure. Sometimes you could be in your room writing, you want peace, and someone can come, an absolute stranger, a new guard can come in, open your door and start checking through your things as you're writing. And going under your blanket, checking for um, they, something that we call What are they looking down. for? I don't know, contraband, drugs. and But you know, worse than that, it comes to a state where you, just, you act as if they're not even near you. You just continue to write. Or you tune it out. Yeah. Huh. I never tune it out, though. I always, for some reason, I just have to rebel some kind of way. That's just, I only do that to keep my state of mind, to believe, to make myself believe I'm still human. I just have to rebel sometimes. Um, there's repercussions from it, but I just have to. Is there any, Mike, self-blame? Is there any time you say, I caused what happened, even though I may be innocent, there's a part of me that caused me to be here? Well, there's no doubt about it. We write our own story in life. Whatever we do, whatever whatever good we do in life, we get good in return. Whatever ill we do, we get ill in return. There's no doubt about it. So you think you're paying for something now? Well, I think I use bad judgment, and I mean, I had to deal with the circumstances that I don't believe was um, normally a fair circumstance, but regardless of the circumstances that I have to deal with. So there's no bitterness? Or is there? I'm not bitterness, but you know, I, this is one time I would like to have a little revenge, you know what I mean? I, I, just, I always go from this perspective. Um, whatever happens, you know what I mean? And sometimes you hit me with your best shot and we see how I handle it. But when the same thing happens to you, we must always remember never to take it personal. I never take this personal. And that's how I used to look at my life. It's never take it personal because eventually one day we'll grow old and we'll die and then we won't have to worry about anyone thinks to say about us any longer. How about anger at the, the woman? Yeah, I, that's, I, I'm, really, I'm not angry. I'm not angry at it. I just, I just despise the actions. 
but not angry or is you no want to see her harmed no not not at all you know what i mean it wouldn't bring me any benefit to see her harmed or hurt but it just let me see if i were to put um in this frame i would say i might an act of treachery but i hate a traitor and it's just the fact that you know I me mean, for someone to take someone's life you know you really never know until you actually spent the amount of time in prison this is only two years for me and you realize they are vicious people. We use the word vicious like a vicious person, but vicious is, is very malice, attack malicely. And it's just to, to obliviate someone's life and their family's life. The thought outside would be that Mike Tyson, even in here, is king of the hill. He's former heavyweight champ. The, the correctional office must respect him. The warden must, I mean, respect athletic ability. You must, there must be a sense of admiration here. Well, because I'm Mike, Chan, Mike Tyson, former heavyweight champion, well, that gives them more reason to despise me. You must understand, we're not in New York City where I roamed in Los Angeles or Paris prisons where I used to roam the streets buying everyone champagne and going in the clubs and living a gay life. It's, I'm just saying we're in a very lethargic type of atmosphere where there's a great deal of people that are confused because they don't understand. They've never been around someone like me. they never hardly experienced being around minorities in general so you know I mean, they look at me kind of funny but they are also despise me despise exactly they don't hold you in awe no how old are you now 27 it's very young very young. do you feel very young i feel great you do yeah. all right i want to touch a lot of bases um the new heavyweight champ did you see the fight no i didn't witness the fight before we talk about the champ give me the schedule like what time they get you up here I go to school at 8 o'clock, and after 8 o'clock, um, we come back at 3.15, and we go to rec, and it's just very, you know what I mean? Same thing every day. Mundane type situation every day. What time do you go to bed? Um, 11 o'clock, 11.30. Do they let you, if you want to wake up in the middle of the night and read, can Yeah, we, we do that. You have to read in a very dark, dim light. I guess that's the torture chamber. Like, you know, in old Spain, <laughs> in the Spanish, you used to have those lights there. It's on all night. I guess it was designed to make you go crazy. You're dripping but, water. They don't do that. No, it's no. cold. And <laughs> I know heat. You have gotten a lot into reading, right? Yeah. Why? I don't know. You know what? I used to read only boxing, only boxing magazines. And then um, from reading the boxing magazines, you, you may read about a, someone, a great writer, may have quoted a fighter. I mean, he may have been very friendly because George Bernard um, Shaw, believe it or not, was very friendly with Gene Tony. You know what I mean? And then that, that just made me... Just great writers are attracted to fighters, always have been. I never knew that. I never knew Norman Mailer was intrigued with boxing. I knew that. Yeah. Um, but no, so, um, I read a guy by the name of Homer, and he wrote about a, a guy, Achilles and Hector, and he wrote about that war. Even though it was so many years ahead of his time, it's been passed down, and he told the story, and I'm sure that things have been um, exchanged from those, from all those years, but the story he said is like as if he was there. And I, I just like reading. I like to read about the writers and the boxers, how they have so much in common. So you're now reading a lot? Ah, I, I've burnt out slightly, but you know, every now and then I go back and forth. Do you, it was, I think Pete Hamill wrote in Esquire that you were reading the classics? Yeah. Like you mentioned Homer, you reading others? Yeah, I read quite a few. And modern novels too? Not too many. Not too many. Unless someone, a modern um, author, send me his book and I read it. What do you do with your mind? In a, in, a, in a place of confinement. You know, you can find everything but your mind. You can't confine someone's mind. And I think that's the only state of you that's actually free at all, even when you're out in the streets. It's the only thing because, as we know, that we have neutrons in our brain, and, and our, brain's on, our body's only purpose is to carry our brain. It's just to carry our brain. And from that perspective only, that I, I believe that we live. It's for our brain to absorb knowledge. Because there's really no wise men in this world. Because as you know, knowledge is just everlasting. The only wise man is God. So I believe we have to look for God within ourselves and just use common sense. Have you found a new faith out of this? Meaning what? Did you change faiths? Did you change your opinion of faith? No, I've, I just always had a great deal of belief. I, I was very confused with God because... I, I, was in, I was in a world where everything was material to me. So I, I didn't see God. I couldn't believe, how, how could I actually believe God? I was almost in the same mentality as the drug dealer. His God was money, his God was what he believed in, the bullet, the gun. Not that I believed in killing or shooting, but I believed more like 
finance and what the finance could bring you. But then again, you have to just use something that's very simple. Like you look at an eagle, he could be 300 feet in the air, and he can see a field mouse. And you, we can't see a field mouse if he's, right in, if he's 10 feet away from us. So if he can see a field mouse from up there, our eyes are not properly programmed for us to see God. Maybe God is not meant for us to see, but he's there. We'll be right back with Mike Tyson after this. We left the subject of religion during the break and started to talk about Joe Lewis being buried in Arlington Cemetery. And you were a great admirer of Joe Lewis. Okay. His son wrote a book about it. And then you mentioned some fighter whose grave you'd like to visit. Yeah, um, for instance, there was a fighter um, by the name of Jack Blackburn. He was Joe Lewis' trainer. And he was a great fighter also. He never won the title. And the reason why is because another fighter at that time was named Joe Gans. That was just magnificent. No one could touch him. He was impossible to beat. All right, so you have faith in a God, right? Allah, yes. Allah. So and now you were raised Catholic. That's been yes. a switch, hasn't it? Yes. How did that happen? Did it happen here? Yeah, you know what? Let's go back to Catholic. I was raised Catholic, um, basically in, a, in a, my home in Brooklyn. But at that particular time, I was running the streets. Religion never hit, had no impact on me. Then I met Don King. Then he... Basically, he put me in this situation, a state of religion. He thought it would be good, but I was, I was, I was champ of the world. I was in another state. I, you didn't need that, Jerry. I didn't need that stuff, and plus, I didn't understand it. So, um, being in here put me in a confinement, put me in a situation to understand Islam, to become a Muslim, and be proud of becoming a Muslim, and to know the situation of the Muslims in this world, and we're becoming extinct. And because other Muslims are allowing it to happen. But you have to understand, there's always a, there's religion, but there's always a, a contradiction in religion. Where you look at one set of people who are supposed to be the same belief, have the same belief as another set, but we preach totally different. But who are we to say who's wrong? But who are we to doubt someone else's faith? You study this a lot then? Yes. Uh, what do you think of what's going on out there in the world with the Farrakhans and the like? I personally, as a person, man, you know, I mean, people differ with me. I, I absolutely love Farrakhan. I don't know the, the gentleman by the name of um, Khalid Muhammad, but Farrakhan as a person, I love Farrakhan. And it's very easy for a person to judge someone for what they say. But a real wise man, a real wise man would never have ill feelings on of the speaker, but to take in heed what he says. If what he says is true, you know, what I mean, you must correct yourself. And if it's not true, you must prevent it from happening. But if he's wrong, you should correct him. Too. If the man's wrong, then what he says has no significance. You don't carry around harsh feelings based on race, do you? No. Did you ever? Out of ignorance, yes. So out of ignorance, you were once like anti-white or anti-Jew or anti- No, no, never that, because if, if I wouldn't know, by looking at a white person, I wouldn't know if anyone in here is Jewish, Irish, Catholic, or Italian. You know what I mean? It's just that we don't know. We don't know, and we're influenced. And that's why I believe that people are so much, um, have, have to differ with Mr. Farrakhan, because the minister, they're afraid that the minister can control somebody's thinking, just like some people um, in the media controls the thinking of people. They feel now they have to compete with somebody for the minds of these people. And he perhaps giving them a run for their money with, without the sophistication that they have, using the, the television, using the cameras. So you think he frightens them? He makes them uneasy, yeah. I believe that. Uh, yourself, what do you what do you miss the most? Oh man, um you just can ask me, I don't know, I never think about anything. You don't so much think, when you're in here, you think yeah. about women? I had I had a problem with that one time. When I first came here I was a little upraid. I used to be very much, oh what's happening here on the phone and you you're very uncomfortable in that, that whole situation. And if whatever happens, happens. Listen, they're out there. They're not mad, so why should I be mad? If they're not mad, I'm not mad. They have to live their miss, life. You miss bonding. Huh? Do you miss other people touching, holding? Yeah, Things right. people miss. Every time I was in that situation where I would bond with somebody, I had no other significant but to bond. And after that, it was emptiness. So what is the purpose of really thinking about it? Because it would be the same as being in prison if there's no actual feelings there. Because then again, we go on a subject, really we don't know what is love. Who knows what is love? You know what I mean, I'm not in a position to, to, to but say what is love. But you've experienced love, attention. You've had that wonderful lady that helped raise you, right? Yeah, but we were looking, talking about love from a different perspective. Okay. You said women. Right, you romantic love. Romantic. You miss romantic love. 
maybe, but what is love? Love is love is like a game. Love is competition. It's competition. Most people who's gorgeous, I mean, a guy or, or a woman maybe, love comes to them all the time because they love, they attract love. But what they never fought for love. Then what are they prepared to do for love? You know what I mean? Love is that a situation where you must be prepared to do something because if you have something lovely, somebody's going to want to challenge you for it. And if you've never been competitive enough, the slightest struggle, you're going to give in. Obviously, you're gaining better control of your own total environment here. What about food? You miss certain foods. You miss certain... No? I'm just... I'm just... I'm trying to... Me. I'm trying yeah. to put the audience into what would it be like just, not to have the things they have every day. I don't know. I'm just... You know, you're in a situation and there's people out in the street that have been to prison. And perhaps a lot worse than the situation I'm in. But you just... You become so much attached to you. You're very much attached to you. You know what I mean? It comes a time where everybody with you, I believe, that somebody a writer by name, he's a playwright named Tennessee Williams said, we must distrust one another because that's the only way we could protect each other from betrayal. And I this interview was taken while Mike Tyson was incarcerated. He was going through the process of um, being incarcerated in America as a celebrity. So we're going to get a, a glimpse at what his first nights were, what um, he felt about you know, the experience. So we can kind of compare it to what we're feeling about R. Kelly and what he may be going through while incarcerated under the terminology of, you know, the convictions. So let's go. And it was that and it was over. Was there a lesson that came out of it? There's some people in here that lie. You know what I mean? They, they don't look to the situation. You know what I mean? They, because they have the authority, their way is the right way. And you're talking about the prison guards who, who are here? Absolutely. You know what I mean? There's people here that are good people. Don't get me wrong. There are good guards here. But you must think of the mentality that it takes for somebody that want to be a prison guard to have a dying thumb on somebody to put your foot on somebody's neck. You know what I mean? It's the authority mostly, perhaps. Just the authority. Being under that kind of authority from a person which in my mentality I would say this person wouldn't even clean my toilet and then of course power is addicting anybody wants power regardless of what kind of power it is they want it and I guess this is their way of showing their power how have you adjusted to losing power um, I've never lost my power you know what I mean because my power was always in me my greatest asset is me it's always me I know some of your friends were concerned that you might face some danger in prison that somebody who doesn't have anything to lose might decide that he's going to make a name for himself and take you on do you ever think about that hey, can i tell you something why would why would anybody you know what i mean what would he gain by it say say cut my throat he beat me up he killed me what would he gain by it do you feel threatened at all just by the fact that um i know that i'm not the, um the most popular inmate in here because you know what I mean I stand up for what I believe in you know what I mean I, I basically say what's on my mind and from prior experience I know that could um, land me in a lot of trouble what about the inmates how the inmates treated you I haven't had any problems just you know sometimes when you walk and, and, it, and you really can understand this prison because this is not like a prison that you may think you walk and people like their homes to be out the window this and that to somebody and you mother this and this and that and this and that and one day so I said Mike Tyson you effing tree jumper and I didn't know what a tree jumper was I thought it meant like I was a great athlete or something like jumping out trees and I was talking about what's a tree jumper is a tree jumper is a rapist you know you wait for little kids to go by you jump out the tree and grab them I said oh Christ you know what I mean I said oh, I can't believe this you know what I mean and it it, oh, it just takes your, your mentality and your, it puts you in a different, different assortment than anything else. And there's no way I could have got it. I could have got a fair shot. I, mean, I knew I was innocent. I knew from court procedures and what was going on, but I knew when I was in that court and when I was going to get that verdict, I knew the verdict was going to be guilty because of the, the mentality of the court and mentality of the prosecutor. What did you think of the prosecutor? The prosecutor, I thought he was um, a racist, weak, um, publicity happy little weak man, and I just felt it. But I was, you know, I mean, I was, I was always nervous and worried because I knew that it was going to take me away from people that I loved. But I was just prepared for it. 
You were prepared to give it up. I, it was something on me that couldn't be stopped. When we come back, Mike... Man, for this cuts not here. You know I me, mean? people, um, they always put that, you know what I mean? They put that like that's a bond, you know what I mean? Well, Cussle will look at you and be ashamed. I'm my own man now. I'm me. I'm my own man. Your finances, are you comfortable with... With your, your finances, your money, the control you have over your money? Absolutely. You know what I mean? About a situation like that. When I was in this situation, no one never, you know what I mean, approached me with something like that before when I was out in the streets. You know what I mean? Now this is a, no, this is only a ploy for somebody to attack Don or do something like that. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm very happy with my finance. Just because someone else may not know anything about my finance or might come up with a sheet and say, well, he has nothing. And then next week they'll come up with a sheet. What happened to this money? They don't show no account of what happened to this 45 million or this 20 million. And now all of a sudden, I'm hiding money. And if I was hiding money, and if it's my money, I haven't stolen it, isn't it my, my business to do what I want with it? Do you know what you have? Well, I have a, a ballpark figure, yes. And you have, you know where it is, and you have control well, of it? Well, like I was saying, it's my business, and no one else should worry about how much money I have. No one, no one should worry about how much Donald Trump has. I never asked how much he has. I never asked how much the Rockefellers or the Rothschilds have. Or Magic Johnson, any athlete by that, nobody asks about that. Why all of a sudden they want to worry about me by putting me in a situation? Because the fact is, they can't take away, which I know, that I'm a great fighter. So they say, God, he's a great fighter. People are mind him for that. But let's put him like he's a great fighter, but he's dumb and he's stupid. So, you know what I mean? He's nobody to look up to. But because it's a, that's okay. Because only time will tell. I mean, that's just time will tell. You mentioned Don King. What about Don King? No, Don King, Don King is just like anyone else. Anybody else is in big business. He's competitive. He competes with them. You know what I mean? He's the best at what he does. Whatever it is. If it's, you know what I mean? He broke all the records, all the, the P.T. Barnum, Zigfield records. He, you know what I mean? He, he breaks all those records. And he's, and he's ornery and he's arrogant. You know what I mean? He says, well, he's like, not under control. You don't control him. You can't say, well, Don, you take this and you do this, but you got to take it. You know what I mean? He wants... He wants the American way. He wants to be get the equal share of the pie. Does he take advantage of no you? No one. Everyone uses someone. He uses me. I uses him. The, the worst thing, we never misuse one another. We respect one another. I never cut his hand. Don is my man, and that's what it is to it. Coming up next, for the, does that automatically mean that she's agreed to have sex with you? Oh, absolutely not. Absolutely not. See, um, this was a situation where we had discussed things that were going to happen, what we were planning on doing, you know what I mean? And we have discussed something. It's just something that's been discussed and planned. And you say, well, since she's going out, she has to do it. She can't eat a free meal. You, you give me, like, that ghetto mentality, of course, like, when I'm stereotyped. She can't get a free meal without giving me something or, or something like that, which is, I you know, I, you know what I mean? It's just perverted. What, you were saying that to me. You know what I mean? She has told her version publicly on television. What was it? that made you feel that she wanted to have sex with you? Well, um, as I was talking, we spoke earlier that day. We had spoke earlier that day, and we had we planned on the situation. You know, everything was arranged. And then I seen her again, and it was arranged again. We, I seen her twice that day. And we, you know I mean, we arranged it again, and that's how I came to that conclusion. There was no doubt in your mind? In neither one of our minds. Mm -hmm. Then let me just ask you to tell me, as you recollect, what happened that night? I called her. I think she was tired or something. I said, don't worry about it. Just call me here and put water in your face. And I, I asked her to wear something short, like a short dress or some wide, loose, baggy shorts. And she came in the car. We kissed and we were making out, okay? fooling around and then we drove right around the corner to my hotel room we got out of my hotel room we went upstairs and we went in my room so when I closed the door we went in my room we sat on my bed she sat on my bed in a somewhat of a Buddha position you know when the legs were crossed and she was talking and we started kissing and she started pulling off her clothes she was getting hot she was getting aggressive and I thought um, we had oral sex and then eventually we had vaginal sex. And after it was over, um, I invited her to stay. I said, because I'm tired, perhaps, because you had to get up at around 5 or 6, and I had to leave at approximately 5, 2 hours. We both had the same schedule, approximately. But she didn't want to do it, but she wanted me to walk her downstairs, and I, I, I didn't want to walk her. 
I said, well, my limo is down, so you can take the limo, but I, I'm sorry, I'm tired, I have to get up, and I, I just can't walk you. Maybe, maybe I should have just walked it downstairs or something. We should never cry over spilled milk, of course, but maybe I should have just walked it downstairs, you know, this is Christ. And the next week I heard about this. And you're saying that she never said no? Oh, absolutely. Now, she said that I hit him, I cried, I did anything to get him to stop, nothing worked. Oh, right, really, please. You know what I mean? Come on, that wasn't true. In a hotel room, in the middle of the night, where you know walls probably echo because it's so quiet, and she screamed, and then she's gonna say she's in shock, she walked downstairs. Evidently, me, the person, you know what I mean? She told me she's in shelter, please. And if anybody would attack me, as soon as I get out in the hallway, I'm, I'm gone. I lost it. I'm in the twilight zone. Woo, help, yes, help right here. Knocking on people's doors. Come in, this guy's right in here. Please help me, or whatever. You know what I mean? That's absurd. Well, I'm scared because he's Mike Tyson. That's, you know what I mean? God, there's something. They insult the American intelligence. You know what I mean? To believe something like that. You know, this is something, you know what I mean? That you don't have to be F. Lee Bailey. You know I mean? You don't have to be F. Lee Bailey at all to decipher the bull crap. You know what I mean? And it just, it upsets me so much because there's people out there, you know what I mean, that have that kind of mentality, you know what I mean, that will believe them. You know what I mean? It just, it's, it's astonishing that what people believe. The truth of the matter of what happened that night then is what? That she was not raped. The end of got you to agree to go into therapy. Is that true? Well, I, I could... I can give you some answers and you could tell me is it true. You know what I mean? I never been to therapy. He never told me that he wanted me to go to, he never told me personally that he wanted me to go to therapy. He's seen me a number of times after the incident happened. He never confronted me with any issues about that or anything. You know what I mean? But, you know what I mean? What, you, what um, Aaron is saying is not true at all. And the women at that, the contest that day in Indianapolis who said that you fondled a number of women. Well, listen, you must understand what kind of um, atmosphere. When you when you make that statement, you come across as if I just ran in that hall, right? And sh 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 sh. No, it wasn't like that. It was a joy to atmosphere. People have grabbed me. You know what I mean? They, they all, it's like um, 15, 20, something like that. They tagged me, grabbed me. You know, we're talking crap, grab, and we're, and we're speaking as young, healthy, black, you know, we young adults do we're talking crap and this and that and things occurred you know what i mean after this situation happened and people were all start saying well maybe i can get something out of it maybe then that their mind the will start rolling in another direction then but at that particular situation there was no complaints about anything so it wasn't initiated by you you just oh, participated absolutely, absolutely. They come after you as much as you go after them. Please, because I mean, this is something I don't even have to. I don't even have to explain to you. You know what I mean? People know who I am, and people know I have money, and people know I'm young. You know what I mean? So they put the two together: young, black, single, with money, usually by himself, never protective, because that's the kind of guy. I'm always loose. I'm like, and that's dangerous because you gotta um, use that with the same stereotype as the the sheep that, that flocks away from the crowd and he's out there now he's alone now the wolves could trap him off corner him off and kill him and that's how my situation was I'm alone and that's my only downfall because I that's my nature I'm always alone I'm always moving you think women used you or tried to use you of course they did but look I looked at it from the standpoint you know what I mean I was young you know what I mean I wanted to have fun I enjoyed having fun and maybe I took it further maybe me wanting to be with some girl or make love to a girl whatever do that but they probably had something different you know what i mean i had in my mind what i they what i wanted but they never let me know what they wanted you know what i mean so maybe I, that's my fault for not knowing not saying well what do you want from this situation you say people uh, who don't know you people form impressions about you here's a guy who is is strong who's black who's uneducated who's a heavyweight champion he thinks he can have whatever he wants how do you respond to people who look at you and think that that's true? 90%, 80% of the people believe what they read. And, I mean, that, that has a big effect on people. If they ever got a chance to know me, they would think differently. They would think totally differently. They would know I'm just like everyone. I like to play. I like to fool around. 
I like to chew fat. You know what I mean? I used to like that. I do basically any young 25 year old do. I used to do that all my life. Least, that's the way I am. I used to like that. I'm just totally, I'm just normal. And that's why I'm in trouble. Because I'm normal and slightly arrogant. You know what I mean? I get a little arrogant because I'm confident. You know, I know whatever I do, I know I'm the best at. You know, and people get upset with that. But you know what I mean? That's a part of me which people, a lot of people don't like. A lot of people don't like themselves. And I happen to be totally in love with myself. You know what I mean? People take that, take offense to that. When it comes to Tyson and women, it's often a question of whom you want to believe. Rarely. You went in your cell and the door was closed and the lights went out. What thoughts did you have? Um, I, I don't know. It, was, it wasn't realistic at that point, but I knew, you know what I mean, after being in my cell, I mean, for a couple of days, though, I just said, you know what I mean, cells are horrible. You just, you'll never forget them. You know what I mean? As long as you live, you know, they live, they, prison itself will always leave, you know what I mean, everlasting effect on me. You know what I mean? You, you just never forget it. And especially a prison like this, you would never forget it. Have you thought about the possibility that you may have to do your time, that the appeal may not be granted? Hey, listen. There's a fact that that may happen, you know what I mean? And I look for it, I look more to the fact that it will happen, you know what I mean? But listen, this, you know I mean, this is something that I passed, you know what I mean? I'm not dead, you know what I mean? As long as I'm breathing, my brain is functioning, my heart is functioning, I prevail. What do you think is your immediate future? I basically, um, I just keep, you know what I mean, go live day by day and wait for the, you know what I mean, see where the chips drop. I might not even want to box. I've been, I've been bored with boxing for four years already. I might not even want to fight anymore once I get out. You think about that? No, I never think about fighting. Never. You think you, if you got out, when you get out, you just give it up? Yeah. What would you do? Huh? I would do something. I'm, I'm always going to be on top. And whatever I do, I'm going to be on top of my game. I'm never going to be under drowning. I'm always going to be above sea level. But the boxing gave you something else that you didn't have. You must understand. I'm basically, regardless of what you see, money, I'm just, I'm just Mike, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm Lorna May's son's man boy street. I'm not, you know, I don't get caught up into a big, big star and all. You know, that's the furthest thing from my mind, you know what I mean? I don't like living like that, so maybe I don't think I want to be a big star no more if that's what they call me. I don't think I want that no more because I don't like living like that. I don't like living where everybody, which I found out in here is true, everybody's a potential enemy. Everybody's potential to hurt you to keep one thing from you i don't like that kind of life because i'm just a normal person so what are your views i mean i feel that this was needed to be compared and put together to create um an understanding of what celebrities truly go through when incarcerated I want to do a part two to this, um, a continuance of, you know, being incarcerated in America under the celebrity status and what um, conviction titles people are held at. Um, It is, let me see here. It is important to share this. Um. And it's a psychological review about an experiment that was done in a prison. And what their aim was to investigate how readily people would conform to the roles of a guard and a prisoner in a role playing exercise that was stimulated as a true prison life experience. So this guy named Zimbardo in 1973 was interested in finding out whether the brutality reported among guards in America prisons was due to the sadistic personality of the guards, the dispositional, or had more to do with the prison environment, which was the situational. So the prisoners and the guards, they um, have conflicted, as you heard Mike Tyson say, and we'll probably hear from R. Kelly's experience that the prisoners have or the guards have a certain type of um, personality in order to just be that character inside of an incarcerated system, knowing that individuals are less than um, 
the human experience wants to see them as, although everybody has their skeletons in their closets. However, the hypothesis was that if the prisoners and guards behaved in a non-aggressive manner, this would support the dispositional um, understanding that it's a situational explanation. So the experience and the procedure was they got 70 applicants that were diagnosed with um, eliminating candidates with psychological problems, medical disabilities, or history of crime or drug use. So they just wanted the strong-minded individual. So they got 70 of them. The study comprised 24 male college students chosen from 75 volunteers who were paid $15 a day to take part in the experiment. Participants were randomly assigned to the role of either a prisoner or a guard. There were no reserves and one person dropped out, finally leaving 10 prisoners and 11 guards. The guards worked in sets of three in eight hour shifts and the prisoners were housed there to house three to a room. There was a solitary confinement for those who misbehaved. It was like a real prison setting. Prisoners were treated like every other criminal being arrested at their homes without warning and taken to the local police station. They were fingerprinted, photographed, and booked. Then they were blindfolded and driven to the psychological department of Stanford University, where Zimbardo had in the basement had the basement set up as a prison with barred doors and windows, bare walls and small cells. The here, the de-individualization process begins. So that's what's happening when we're incarcerated at the time we are. It's based upon our mindset of how we um, see the world based on what created the connection to the incarceration and the experience that we brought with us. So desensitization is very, um, you know, it, it definitely happens when a person is incarcerated. So the, they use the ID number. So you're limited to being a number. Um, in this number, you are, um, you are told that you have to respond to this number. So they dehumanize you. They make you a robotic character. So the, the guards are dressed in identical khaki suits. They wear the wrist whistle around their necks and a billy club um, borrowed from the police. The guards also wore special sunglasses so they wouldn't be able to look into the eyes of the prisoners or they will be they won't be able to make contact either way. Three guards work shifts, like I said, eight hours, and guards were instructed to do whatever they thought was necessary to maintain law and order in the prison and to command the respect of the prisoners, but no physical violence was permitted. Zimbardo observed the behavior of the prisoners and guards as a researcher and also acted as a prison ward. What they found, within a very short time, both guards and prisoners were settling into their new roles, with the guard adapting the theirs quickly and easier. So the guards were much easier to adapt to their situation than the prisoners, of course. Within hours of being um, beginning the experiment, some guards began to harass prisoners. At 2.30 a.m., prisoners were awakened from sleep by blasting whistles for the first of many counts. The count served as a way to familiarize the prisoners with their numbers. More importantly, they provided a regular occasion for the guards to exercise control over the prisoners. The prisoners soon adapted prison, prisoner-like behavior too. They talked about prison issues a great deal of the time. They told tales of each other's to the guards. They started taking the prisoners' rules very seriously as though... Oh, they started to take the prison rules very seriously as though they were there for the prisoners. Benefit and infringement would spell disaster for all of them. Some even began siding with the guards against prisoners who did not obey the rules. There was the physical punishment were taunting insults and petty orders given pointless, boring tasks to accomplish. And they were generally dehumanized. Push-ups were a common form of physical punishment imposed by the guards. 
Um, one of the guards stepped on the prisoners' backs while they did push-ups or made other prisoners sit on the back of fellow prisoners during their push-ups. Asserting independence. So because the first day passed without incident, the guards were surprised and totally unprepared for the rebellion, which broke out on the morning of the second day. So in this experiment, during the second day of the experiment, the prisoners removed their stocking caps, ripped, ripped off their numbers and barricaded themselves inside the cells by putting their beds against the door. The guards called in reinforcements. The three guards who were waiting on standby came in and night shift guards voluntarily remained on duty. So the guards retaliated by using a fire extinguisher with uh, shot a well, which shot a stream of skin chilling carbon dioxide and the ringleaders of the, the, ringleaders of the prison. Um, the guards, uh, let me see, retaliated by using a fire extinguisher, which shot a stream of skin chilling carbon dioxide, and they forced the prisoners away from the doors. Next, the guards broke into each cell, stripped the prisoners naked, and took the beds out. The ringleaders of the prison rebellion were placed into solitary confinement. After this, the guards generally began to harass and intimidate the prisoners. Now, in this experiment, these were individual volunteers that were paid $15 a day to actually go through the course of being a prisoner, whatever, or a guard. So these individuals are being desensitized and dehumanized based upon the prison um, situation. So special privileges. Um, one of the three cells was designated as a privileged cell. The three prisoners least involved in the rebellion were given special privileges. The guards gave them back their uniform and beds and allowed them to wash their hair and brush their teeth. Privileged prisoners also got to eat special food in the presence of the other prisoners who had temporarily lost the privilege of eating. The effect was to break the solidarity among prisoners. The consequences of the rebellion. So after the next few days, the relationship between the guards and the prisoners changed with a change in one leading to a change in the other. Remember that the guards were firmly in control and the prisoners were totally dependent on them. As the prisoners became more dependent, the guards became more derisive towards them. They held the prisoners in contempt and let the prisoners know it. As the guards' contempt for them grew, the prisoners became more submissive. So as the prisoners became more submissive, the guards became more aggressive and assertive. They demanded ever greater obedience from the prisoners. The prisoners were dependent on the guards for everything. So try to find ways to please the guards, such as telling tales of fellow, fellow prisoners. Here's an example. Prisoner number 8612, less than 36 hours in the experiment, began suffering from acute emotional disturbance, disorganized thinking, uncontrollable crying and rage. After a meeting with the guards where they told him he was weak, but offered him informant status, number 68612 returned to the other prisoners and said, you can't leave, you can't quit. Soon, 8612 began to act crazy, to scream, to curse, to go into a rage that seemed out of control. It wasn't until this point that the psychologists realized they had to let him out. A visit from the parents. The next day, the guards held a visit hour for parents and friends. They were worried that when the parents saw the state of the jail, they might ins insist on taking their sons home. Guards washed the prisoners, had them clean and polished their cells, fed them a big dinner and played music on the intercom. After the visit, rumors spread of a mass escape plan. Afraid that they would lose the prisoners, the guards and experimenters tried to enlist the help and facilities of the Palo Alto Police Department. The guards against again escalated the level of harassment, forcing them to do menial, repetitive work, such as cleaning toilets with their bare hands. Then Zimbardo in invited the Catholic priest, who had been a prison chaplain for um, a realistic prison situation. Half of the prisoners introduced themselves by their numbers rather than name. The chaplain interviewed each prisoner individually. The priest told them the only way they would get out was to help was with the help of a lawyer. So here's prison number 819. Eventually, while taking talking to the priest, 
Number 819 broke down and began to cry hysterically just to previously released prisoners had. The psychologist removed the chain from his foot, the cap off his head, and told him to go and rest in a room that was adjacent to the prisoner's yard. They told him they would get him some food and then take him to see a doctor. While this was going on, one of the guards lined up the other prisoners and had them chant aloud. Prisoner 819 is a bad prisoner because of what prisoner 819 did. My cell is a mess, Mr. Correction Officer. So the psychologist realized that 819 could hear the chanting and went back into the room where they found him sobbing uncontrollably. The psychologist tried to get him to agree to leave the experiment, but he said he could not leave because the others had labeled him a bad prisoner. Back to the reality. At this point, Zimbardo said, listen, you are not 819. You are, and he gave his name. And my name is Dr. Zimbardo. I'm a psychologist, not a prison superintendent, and this is not a real prison. This is just an experiment, and those are students, not prisoners, just like you. Let's go. He stopped crying suddenly, looked up and realized, and, and replied, okay, let's go, as if nothing had been wrong. As the end of the experiment was done, but the sixth day was terminated. A recent Stanford PhD brought into the con um, brought in to conduct interviews with the guards and prisoners strongly objected when she saw the prisoners being abused by the guards. Filled with anger, she said, it's terrible what you are doing to these boys out of 50 or more outsiders who have seen our prison. She was the only one who ever questioned its morality. Zimbardo in 2008 later noted, it wasn't until much later that I realized how far into my prison role I was at that point, that I was thinking like a prison superintendent rather than a research psychologist. So here's the conclusion. People were readily conformed to the social rules they are expected to play, especially if the roles are as strongly stereotyped as those of the prison guards. The prison experiment was an important factor in creating the guards' brutal behavior. None of the participants who acted as guards showed sadistic tendencies before the study. Therefore, the findings support the situational explanation of behavior under the dispositional one. So Zimbardo proposed that two processes can explain the prisoner's final submission. De-individualization may explain the behavior of the participant, especially the guard. This is a state when you become so immersed in the norms of the group that you lose your sense of identity and personal responsibility. The guards may have been so sadistic because they did not feel what happened was done to them personally. It was a group norm. The, they also may have lost their sense of personality um, identity because of the uniforms they wore. What are your thoughts there? This is an experiment with just regular individuals. And we're not even talking about people who have been truly convicted of crimes for that fight and believe in their innocence. What are your thoughts? Also, learned helplessness could explain the prisoner's submission to the guards. The prisoners learned that whatever they did had little effect on what happened to them. In the mock prison, the unpredictable decisions of the guards let the prisoners to give up responding. After the prison experiments was terminated, Zimbardo interviewed the participants. Here's an excerpt. Most of the participants said they had felt involved and committed. The research had felt real to them. One guard said, I was surprised at myself. I made them call each other names and clean the toilets out with their bare hands. I practically considered the prisoners cattle. And I kept thinking I had to watch out for them in case they tried something. Another guard said acting authoritatively can be fun. Power can be a great pleasure. And another, during the inspection, I went to cell two to mess up a bed, which a prisoner had just made. And he grabbed me screaming that he had just made it and that he was not going to let me mess it up. He grabbed me by the throat. And although he was laughing, I was pretty scared. I lashed out with my stick and hit him on the chin, although not very hard. And when I freed myself, I became angry. They were told not to use physical force, though, in this experiment. 
Um, but as you see, they, they did not follow the rules. Most of the guards found it difficult to believe that they had behaved in a brutalized way that they had. Many said that they hadn't known this side of them existed or they were capable of such things. The prisoners too couldn't believe that they had responded in submission, dependent and um, served claim to be assertive normally. When asked about the guards, they described the usual three stereotypes that can be found in any prison. Some guards were good, some got, some were tough but fair, and some were cruel. Critical evaluation. Demand characteristics could explain the findings of the study. Most of the guards later claimed they were simply acting. Because the guards and prisoners were playing a role, their behavior may not be influenced by the same factors. However, there is a considerable evidence that the participants which react to the situation as though it was real. For example, 90% of the prisoners' private conversations, which were monitored by the researchers, were on the prison condition, and only 10% of the time were there conversations about life outside the prison. The guards, too, rarely exchanged personal information during their breaks. They either talked about problem prisoners, other prison topics, or not at all. The guards were also on time and even worked overtime for no extra pay. When the prisoners were introduced to a priest, they referred to themselves by the prison number rather than their first name. Some even asked him to get a lawyer to help them get out. The study may also lack population validity as the sample comprised male students. The, the study's findings cannot be applied to female prisons or those from other countries. For example, America is an individual um, culture where people are generally less conforming and the results may be different in um, in other cultures such as Asian. A strength of the study is that it has altered the way the U.S. prisons are run. For example, for example, juveniles accused of federal crimes are no longer housed before trial with adult prisoners due to the risk of violence against them. Another strength of the study is that the harmful Treatment of participant led to the former recognition of ethical guidelines of the American Psychological Society. Studies must now over, or undergo an extensive review by an institutional review board or ethics committee before they are implemented. And um, the ethical issues that came about in some of the criticisms of this case study um, now shows us when we go through our doctoral thesis study or when we go through our master's level, we cannot um, do studies, human studies, without um, the approval, um, without approval. So I just wanted to share some things about what could possibly be going on while incarcerated and in the uh, criminal justice system of America with convictions titles. And I just hope that we've cleared some things up. We just pray that all goes well with Robert Sylvester Kelly and that if Mike Tyson got through it, if Barry, if Chuck Berry got through it, I think that we can, we can say there's a lot of people that's gone through the criminal justice system and R. Kelly may be in there to learn his own uh, stories that he can come out and share with us. I know that's what I did. The sharing of the story is the most vital because it helps people realize how the system is set up. You know, um, as real Clary said it best when she says some people play play checkers, I play chess. We have to think mentally to defeat the demon of, of incarceration because sometimes we can walk into a trap that is set and what we don't know can very well hurt us. So I thank you so much for liking, commenting, joining, and subscribing to this podcast. I hope this was helpful. Thank you for all your comments. And as always, keep it 100 and we'll see you next time.